explore. And so persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect, yet there have, has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others. In other words, uh, you don't find throughout history where Baptists are persecuting or killing other Christians. We're trying to persuade them of the truth, yes. It was always the other way around. The Roman Catholic Church was killing, literally killing Baptists, drowning them because they believed in baptism by immersion rather than sprinkling a baby on his head. Uh, we didn't believe in, in you just taking your baby down to the church house and bringing him up to the altar and the priest comes down and just sprinkles water on his head and he's baptized, he becomes a Christian. No, you don't find that in the Bible. And so Baptists have always had a problem with that. So they were always looking to, to bring true doctrine to the people of that day. And they would say, okay, look, you were baptized as a baby. The vast majority of them were. And it took a long time for them to come out of a lot of that. But they were baptized as babies. And they'd say, okay, we need to rebaptize you the right way. You're going to get baptized by immersion after you got saved. And so they got known. They became known as Anabaptists. Or rebaptizers, and that's where some of our name comes from. Uh, and we have we we have ever been ready to suffer, as our martyrologies will prove. But we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with the government. And we will never make the church, although the queen, the the dis, the despot over the consciences of men. So Baptists, I, I'm, in a minute, I'll get into uh, John Bunyan which is a wonderful story if you ever get a chance. Of course, you know John Bunyan wrote that book, The Pilgrim's Progress, and he wrote it in prison. And if you study how he got to prison, it'll shock you. Um, he was a man who believed a lot like, much like the Baptist, as a Baptist, he believed, we believed that no one is going to keep me from studying the Bible and understanding the, the, the God of the Bible. Uh, no one's going to keep me from doing that according to the dictates of my conscience. No one can stop that. And Baptists have always said, come in, read the Bible, understand the Bible, and believe it. Live by it. Don't let anyone tell you anything else. If it's Bible, it's Baptist. If it's Baptist, it's Bible. We've always said that. And that's what I love and appreciate so much about the Baptists is we want to know what thus saith the Lord. Okay. And so I'm going to go through this uh, rather quickly, so I'm going to at least try to. Um, this, we're going over the Baptist distinctives. I was going to go over the fundamentals of the faith. I don't know that I'll have time to go into that. Uh, maybe next time. There's a lot of talk about fundamentalism today. And uh, it's a good subject to talk about. Uh, there are fundamentals of the faith that a lot of different groups out there in Christendom, they deny, like the deity of Christ. That's a fundamental of the Christian faith. It is essential to the Christian faith. Um, or the virgin birth of Christ. Okay, that is an essential truth. We can't get outside of that. Or uh, there, there's, there's some other ones as well. Uh, but tonight I want to go over Baptist distinctives. These are things that have set Baptists apart throughout the ages. But you find these common characteristics. And again, we're, we're not Baptists because John was a Baptist. Okay? Oh, John the Baptist, therefore I'm a Baptist. That's, that's someone that's ignorant and has not studied Baptist history. You cannot find Baptist, the, the name Baptist assigned to any people group past the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there's people that say, well, you find the term Anabaptist and so on going back. Uh, but remember, John the Baptist was a Baptist because of what he was doing. Because he was baptizing. Uh, and we did not re start receiving that name until we started being called Anabaptist. And, uh, of course, it stuck and. After a while, they said, look, stop calling us Anabaptists because we're not rebaptizing people. We're baptizing them. Just call us Baptists. And so uh, after a while, we, we got that name. So anyways, it's the acrostic Baptist, B-A-P-T-I-S-T. -T, and I think there's another S after there. And we're going to go over these distinctives, okay? So we start with B, okay? Believers' uh, baptism by immersion only. Turn with me to John chapter number 3. John chapter 3, verse 23. It says there, in verse 23, it says, And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem, because there was much water there. Now, why do you suppose there needed to be much water there? Probably because they couldn't just take a handful of water and dump it on someone. No, they needed somewhere where they could fully immerse someone in the water. And they came and were baptized, okay? Look with me in Acts chapter 8. 
Acts chapter 8, verse 36. It says there in verse 36, it says, They went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? This guy, he, uh, <clears throat> the, the eunuch, right? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, they're, they're sitting there. He couldn't understand the scriptures. He needed someone to come and guide him through the scriptures. Same thing that we're supposed to be doing today, helping people understand the gospel, walking them through the scriptures. And he says, okay, you're telling me I need to believe and I'll be saved. Well, what doth hinder me to be baptized? In verse 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, what was the prerequisite to being baptized? Believe. If you're a believer, then you get baptized. It wasn't you get baptized and then you're saved. Remember, the Bible is dogmatic that a believer is a child of God. A believer is saved. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, before we baptize someone, we ask them, Are you a believer? Have you been saved? Yes, I've been saved. Said, okay, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And we're baptizing them not because uh, so they can get saved, right? Like our uh, Church of Christ friends believe. Uh, they believe that baptism is part of salvation. In other words, if I'm at, down at the hospital and so and so is on his deathbed and he wants to get saved, too bad, you missed it, you got to get baptized too. Or uh, what about the thief on the cross? He was hanging on that cross. How are we going to baptize him? We can't. He's on the cross. But guess what Jesus said? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Listen. Uh, baptism, as much as you want to twist scripture, and I realize there are some verses that you might get a little confused about it. Study the surrounding verses. Study the context of what's actually being said there, and you'll understand that the Bible is not teaching that baptism is for salvation. Baptists have always been well known for their stand on immersion. The word baptism, or baptism uh, literally means immersion. Okay? Uh, baptism requires four things. A candidate authority, a mode, and a purpose, okay? So a candidate is one who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. We learned about that in verse 37. And so belief precedes baptism. By the way, this eliminates little babies. Can a baby confess to you that he's a believer in Jesus Christ? No. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Can a baby hear the gospel and respond to it? With his, by his own will? No. And, and a lot of that was just the church giving people comfort and saying, you want your baby to be saved, don't you? Okay, bring him in. We'll baptize him and they'll be saved. That is, is terrible. It's not anywhere found in Scripture. And uh, a lot of that comes from the Roman Catholic Church. And we've always had a problem with it. Um, I mean, in this debate, the subject of infant baptism, it's not as prominent today now. But if you study Baptist history, it's a huge chunk a huge chunk of that study is about infant baptism because it was so prominent in that day. Um, and then authority. You need to have an authority. The local church is the authority. And there's debate over who can baptize. Does it need to be an ordained minister? Does it need to be a pastor? Can a deacon baptize someone? Can, can any Christian baptize someone? Uh, I tell you what, you go figure that out on your own. I'm not going to tell you what to believe on that, but there needs to be an authority and it needs to be the local New Testament church. I'm not for anyone who's just out in the world and is not a, a part of a church to just go out and start baptizing people. They had something recently on the news in Florida where they're just out in the ocean and they're doing these baptismal services and people are walking by and saying, I want to be baptized too. And they're like, okay, come on out and get baptized. And, and they had like some thousand some odd people get baptized that day. Come on. Okay, have these people heard the gospel? Have you confronted them about their sin? And, and how that Jesus died for their sin and that they're on their way to hell. And, and No, they just want this experience. They just want something that says, I'm part of the faith now because I got baptized. But if you ask them, why are you going to heaven? They couldn't tell you. In fact, they'll probably say, well, because I was baptized. I mean, go ask some of these people. Why are you going to heaven? Well, I got baptized back at so-and-so. Or my dad was a pastor or, or, or this, that, and the other. I go to church. I'm faithful to church. One of the best questions you can ask someone to know if they're saved, why are you going to heaven? If they say anything other, but anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ, we've got a problem, okay? So mode, three modes. There's a fusion, which is pouring, 
Okay, and this, this, that's a wrong mode. This is modes in Christendom that, that people perform. Aspersion, which is sprinkling, and then immersion, which is to dip or plunge. Of course, we believe in immersion. Baptism is symbolic. However, if, we're, however, if we are wanting to be biblical and follow the example, y'all are taking them kids nice and early, right? Amen. Uh, if we want to be biblical, we understand baptism is sim- symbolic. Okay, it's symbolic. What? Of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Greek word is baptizo, okay, which literally means to plunge, dip, or fully engulf. Now, listen, this can get out of hand, okay? Here's what I mean by that. There, there are some people who get, well, it only really becomes an issue if you believe baptism is part of salvation. The Church of Christ does this. They say, if your pinky is out of the water when you get baptized, you didn't fully get saved. See, the Church of Christ also believes in, they believe in immersion. Okay, but they, they're so legalistic that they say if your pinky's out of the water, you get baptized. Oh, it wasn't fully there. And so listen, it is by immersion. But, you know, I've heard people say, well, if the pastor is not in the water with him, because if you go look at Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, it says they went down into the water together and got baptized. Listen, stop trying to be so legalistic on everything. Okay. Uh, I know of pastors that all they have is a little tub, okay? And the pastor is standing outside the tub, and he's baptizing these new believers and dipping them and emerging them. We don't need to get so... Remember, this is symbolic, but we want to be as biblical as we can. Uh, listen, if I've got a tub where I can get down all the way in, I'm going down in it. Why? Because Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch did that. They went down into it together. All right, we, we do want to be as biblical as we can, but I'm just saying we need to be careful that we didn't get so like, oh, uh oh, his pinky was out. We need to go do it again. OK. A horse chop. OK, there you go. I mean, you've got to you've got to have something there. Right. And so both and both, I believe, I, you know, I, if I were practicing it, I'm going to do my best for us both to get into the water together. OK, the purpose and this is the most important. It's the first act of obedience. You know, if people take a long time to get baptized after they get saved, it's not going to take long, and they're just not really getting into the Christian life. They're not, they're not identifying with Christ. They're ashamed, if you really think about it. They don't want to identify with Christ in front of a congregation. Uh, the, you know, there shouldn't be any shame. You should be saying, amen. If you went to the first century... Those Christians, listen, look at the Ethiopian eunuch. He's like, what doth hinder me to be baptized? I want to be baptized right now. Now look, he didn't have a crowd of people around him. He, I don't know who all was there. We don't know. We weren't there. Uh, but what is the purpose of it? It's, I, sometimes I'll tell people it's kind of like in our day today, people want to go on Facebook and social media and say, I did this or I did that. It, back in the day, if you went down to the river and got baptized, the people knew you were identifying with those crazy Christians. It was a big deal. I mean, he's like, oh, look, he's getting baptized. He must have got saved or he must have become a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're trying to do today. We want people to get saved and then come into the church house and get baptized and identify with Christ with other believers so we don't have to question them anymore. Okay, who are these people? When they get baptized, it's a good step of faith. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay, number two is authority. Authority and absolute inerrancy of the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16. Okay, 2 Timothy 3.16. Turn with me there. Boy, we may not get through this acrostic at all. Might have to come back. I don't know. I preached this one time at my church back home. And... um, (laughs) It, I went way too long, and uh, it, it didn't go down too bad, but ended up, having to, ended up having to really rush through the last few points, and so I really I hope I don't have to do that tonight. All right, if I can find. Goodness. All right, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and many of you have it memorized. I hope you do. All Scripture is what? Is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? 
It says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Baptists have always been Bible believers. We just want to know what the Bible says. We believe in the inspiration of Scripture. The supernatural, here's a good definition of that. The supernatural influence exerted on the human penman by the Holy Spirit, by virtue of which their writings are given divine truthfulness and constitute an infallible guide and sufficient rule of faith and practice. Word salad. Uh, but let, let me tell you what it, gen, what it basically means. A lot of people say, well, it's God-breathed. Okay? Um, others have a problem with that definition. They say it's given by the Spirit of God. You, you think about the word inspiration. It's given by the Spirit of God. But here's what's important. We need to understand that it's not the penmen that were inspired. What does it say? It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God inspired the Scriptures. It's His words that He gave to human penmen, and they wrote it down exactly the way that God wanted it written down. When you jump into the world of there's errors in Scripture. As soon as you jump into that world, you've got a mess on your hands. Because now you cannot trust your very own salvation. You can't trust the things you believe. You don't know what's right and what's wrong. And there's a big problem. You actually turn God into a liar. And God cannot lie. The Bible tells us that. And so the Bible is inspired. It's inerrant. Unlike the Pope, it's without error. When you, when you believe in inerrancy of Scripture, you have no need to change it. And this is just one reason why we stand on the King James Bible. A verbal inspiration. Each word comes directly from God. These were not men that were inspired. The Scriptures were given by inspiration. And by the way, the Bible tells us that even the copies... We've got to understand something tonight. When we go back to these books of the Old Testament like Isaiah and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and, and all these Old Testament uh, writings. There was only one original. How long do you suppose that original lasted? Probably not all that long. Once it was used up, guess what they had to do? They didn't have the internet back then. They didn't have uh, printers back then. They didn't have any of that. And so guess what? Someone called a scribe would have to come along and rewrite it and copy it and they would copy it and make so many copies and pass it off to other groups and today we still have the scriptures and God says he's gonna preserve it and here's what's neat if you go to the New Testament the Bible still calls those scriptures the, 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 the book that that the eunuch was reading the Bible calls it scripture it doesn't say that you know he was reading a book or he was reading some writings some some copies it doesn't say that it says he was reading scriptures and then the bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine so we got to understand something what we're reading tonight is the scriptures and god has preserved it throughout all generations just like he said he would the bible is plenary which means it's full and complete we're not searching for more of God's Word. All 66 books make up the complete canon of Scripture that God has for us to live for, for Him. We, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talk today about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Everyone's digging around for more Word of God. Do you really believe God is hiding His Word under a rock somewhere? I don't. Now, if you want to believe that, that's fine. There's, uh, you go right ahead. Uh, there's all kinds of different books out there and scrolls that have been found in caves and people pull them out and say oh we've got more scripture all of a sudden i you know i'm just not one of those guys because i believe that god is who he says he is he's going to preserve his word and he's not going to hide it from me he's going to make it available to me and i believe he's done that in the 66 books of the word of god or the canon they call it canonization of scripture okay and so it's been kept available god is not playing games with humanity he's not trying to hide his word like some treasure to be discovered. It is available to us because he promised to make it available. Psalm 12, 6 through 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, there are some people, and uh, again, I, I'm very careful with what I'm dogmatic about, because it, one day I'm going to hear about it if I'm wrong. I, you know, can we all accept that? I mean, one day we're going to hear, 
you know, that thing that you were standing up behind that pulpit and preaching as truth, you were wrong about that. And I, I want to keep a short count of the things I'm wrong about, okay? Uh, but some people believe that that verse where it says, um, Thy words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Some people believe that that gives us some indication that, be, uh, that the King James Bible, because it went through seven, it went through seven, I'm trying to think of the word, not revisions, maybe you want to call it revisions. It went through seven purification processes, if you will, where they had to go out and then, oh, we put a period right here and there shouldn't be a period and they had to fix it. Um, now, others are like, no, it didn't even go through seven. It went through 12 or went through 15 or whatever else. You'd have to go study, study it on your own. But there's some people that'll stand up and say, no, the King James Bible, it went through seven revisions and that verse is talking about the King James Bible. Now, I'll let you go figure that out on your own. Amen? You guys good with that? Okay, uh, John T. Ch T. Christian said, uh, and he was a Baptist, he said, their, their ties, he was talking about Baptists, their ties of organization are so slender, their government so democratic in nature, and their hearty independence so universal, that it has been a wonder to some historians and a mystery inexplicable to those who have not understood their genius, how they have retained their hum um, homogeneity, state of being the same, which is what that means, and solidarity, their unity, their like-mindedness, but holding as they have ever done the absolute and unconditional authority of the New Testament as the sole rule of faith and practice in religious matters. What he's trying to say is, it's incredible how these Baptists have not come together and created some big organization, because, and they're still alive today. They're still kicking. Uh, why? Because our headquarters is in heaven, and our book is right here. And as long as we all stick to this, we're going to continue to be Baptists. And that's how we are. We don't have some big headquarters somewhere. Our headquarters is up there. Amen? Um, and so, <laughs> Marge, you're getting a kick out of this tonight, huh? Uh, the, the P's, the number, number three, the three P's. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. Christ is our great high priest, found in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16. He's our great high priest. We don't need a priest. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and turn there, if you will. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16. It says, For we have not an high priest. Who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. It says, who, who cannot, Which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You know, some people will teach, well, Christ, he must have sinned because he was tempted. No, temptation is not sin. Sin does not become sin until you give in to temptation. We all fight temptation. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, when he was robed in flesh, God with us, the manual, right? Uh, God uh, uh, in the flesh, when he was in that position, in that state, he was in all points tempted as we are. He experienced all that temptation. He was just the only man who never gave in to it. Amen? And so, he is our high priest. Christ is the great high priest, but we have a New Testament priesthood. We have a New Testament priesthood, and that's found in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verses 5 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood talking about us, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Am I your guys' priest today? Is pastor your guys' priest? No. Is there any mediator between God and man? No. Christ Jesus. He is the only mediator. And uh, we don't need a man. You don't need to come confess your sins to me. Now, you may have some issues and some things that you want to talk about. You want to go through some counseling. You want to talk to your pastor. The Bible says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Uh, and that's what a pastor is here for, to help you through those things. But your job is not to come confess them. And he waved his hand over your head and said, you've been forgiven, child. No. That's wrong. Uh, God is the one that we go through. And we are our own priests. And we call them believer priests. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 2 first timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 and i'll read that for you real quick first timothy um, chapter 2 
and verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, and so we've got to understand that tonight. We don't need, we, we've always believed that we all can go to the Bible, we can study it for ourselves, and according to the dictates of our own conscience and what the Bible says, we can live for God, okay? Number two, a polemical defense of the faith. You always find, in fact, they got a little out of control from time to time. They, were, they, they would have meetings and debate sessions where they would get together and they would have full-blown debates over subjects, over Scripture. And I believe the Bible warns us of getting too, getting too much into that, vain babblings and things that are, are, aren't, aren't all that important. It would be better for us to give ourselves over to soul winning and winning people to Christ than debating with people all over the place. Okay? Uh, but they were very much involved in the polemical defense of the faith. We mentioned that verse, Jude 1, 3. Earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay? Uh, it requires that we make judgments, but not hypocritically. Let's remember that the Bible says, let, the, let judgment begin at the house of the Lord. You say, we're not supposed to judge people. At the end of the day, what those verses are talking about is that I'm not the judge. But it is my job to give the word of God to people as they are. And I'm to do that as lovingly as I can. Because what does the Bible say? It says, speak the truth in love. And people will say, well, you're judging me. No, I'm God's judging you. I'm giving you the word of God. That's our job. Now, if I were to take someone because they're homosexual and lock them up in prison because they're homosexual, that's wrong. That's not my job to do that. Okay? So we believe in a polemical defense of the faith. What is polemics? An aggressive, often offensive defense of the faith. Now, ap apologetics, which is a very similar word, it just, it's apologetics rather, rather than polemics, is a reason, systematic defense of the faith. Now, we've got to be careful. Um, I'm not against apologetics, but we've got to be careful when we just fully adopt this idea of apologetics. Um, we have the idea that we can reason with people. Um, and, 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 you know, there, there is some of that. And we need to have some of that. And it's good for the next generation and, and all that involved. I'm, I'm for going to the Ark Encounter and looking at that Ark and, and all the science that's involved in creation. I love that stuff. But at the end of the day, everyone must come to God by faith. And there's this thing called the foolishness of preaching. And we hate it, but that's what God uses to convict hearts and to convict people's minds and, and to convict them to come to God. And so this is widely deba debated, but it's okay if we have different views on this subject. Some people are all for apologetics. they got full-blown degrees on it now. Um, it is important to remember that everyone must come to God on the same basis, and that's faith. Finding the line where the truth is preached in love is often very fine, but Baptists have always maintained a polemical defense of the faith by declaring the word of God as it is to men as they are. Number three, primacy of the New Testament. We're in those three P's. Primacy means to be more important or of utmost importance. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, or what does this mean by that? It means uh, that we've got to understand that the New Testament completes the Old Testament. If we were to just have the New Testament, we'd have issues. We need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. But, if we were to just have the Old Testament, we miss salvation. Um, it's very important that we have a, a place in emphasis or a primacy of the New Testament. In other words, do we worship on the Lord's Day or on the Sabbath day? Well, if you just stay in the Old Testament, you're going to develop, no doubt, the idea that God wants us to worship just on the Sabbath day. Now listen, there are uh, Seventh-day Baptists out there that are very uh, dogmatic that they're right in this, and that's fine. They, they, listen, everyone can do whatever they want. I'm not here to force anyone to do anything. Uh, but we place an emphasis on the New Testament and that the Lord's Day they met on Sunday. And that's why we have, that's why we worship on Sunday. That's why we have church services on Sunday. Let me give you an example, another example. Is it okay for the New Testament Christian to eat pork or not eat pork? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So do we take that and just get the idea that, well, uh, that verse just, just simply doesn't matter? Uh, in fact, turn with me over there to 1 Timothy chapter 4 real quick. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's read verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, 
giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Anytime the word devil is in plural, we could easily just input the idea of demons. It's those working for Satan, okay? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So the Bible's warning us about these false teachers that are out there. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Now look, I've got Baptist friends that don't believe you need to pray before you eat. If that's what they want to believe, Go right ahead. I can tell you right now, based off of what the Old Testament says about pork, I'm going to pray before I eat pork. <laughs> um, based off of what the Old Testament says about shellfish, and, and we got to we got to mind there were dietary laws in the Old Testament. There were different different categories of laws. There were there were uh, customary laws. There were uh, dietary laws. There were uh, various different forms of laws. The dietary law, a lot of the dietary laws have drastically changed in the New Testament. They really have. God is, has, has changed that. Uh, does that mean that those things are good for you? We know, based off of science, that pork is not good for you. Right? And so is it wrong? Is it wrong to abstain from pork? Absolutely not. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that from a dietary perspective at all. Is it wrong to abstain from shellfish and other things? You know, there's some unclean animals out there that you probably, I need to stay away from. I, I, I tell you, I love, and don't judge me for this, okay? McDonald's makes a really good sausage, egg, and cheese McMuffin. I'm just saying, look, but I know, I know that th that sausage that I'm eating is catching up with me. Because it's not, like, it's not a good food to eat. We know that. Uh, but when we look at the Word of God, if I receive it with thanksgiving, I don't know if God just miraculously makes it good for me or what he does, uh, but all of a sudden it's not of the law. It's not. And so without the New Testament, the gospel would still be a mystery. It would be unrevealed. The New Testament not only complements the Old Testament, it seals the Old Testament. Okay? Someone said the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. There's another, if you're writing this stuff down, there's another passage in Acts chapter 10, verses 13 through 15, that covers this issue of eating meats or not eating certain meats, okay? Number, number four is the T, the two ordinances. We've got to hurry. Uh, Baptists have always recognized only two ordinances as given in the New Testament. Both ordinances are purely symbolic. This is important. Okay, remember, the baptism was symbolic. It's all symbolic, okay? Um, they're not sacraments. We need to be careful that we don't call them sacraments. Okay, these are, the sacraments were something that, and it could be other groups too. I know a lot of those Protestant groups, they pulled out of the Catholic Church, but they didn't get rid of everything. They held on to a lot of that stuff. It was so engraved into them uh, that they just held on to a lot of it, and the sacraments is one of them. Uh, for a while now, for a while there, the Catholic Church was teaching uh, what was called transubstantiation. It's a big word. It, it literally just means that the, 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 the grape wine juice that they were drinking was literally the blood of Jesus. Uh, they also taught that the little wafer that they put in their mouth literally became the flesh of Jesus as you're eating it. And, uh, and so, I mean, it's just, it's just wild, some of the things that they that they come up with. Um, and so we believe in baptism for identification, right? To be obedient and declaring to believers your decision to follow Christ. And then, and by the way, these are commands in Scripture. Why do we do these things? Because it looks a little religious. I'm not going to lie. <coughs> when I first started going to church after I got saved, all of a sudden they had the Lord's Supper, and I was like, this is weird. All of a sudden things have changed. You know, it's like we're doing something really religious now. Is, am I the only one like that? I'm probably the only one like that. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is weird. It's all formal. We're passing these things around. And, but, but, you know, the Bible commands it. Jesus commanded it. He said, this do in remembrance of me. Uh, baptism is a commandment. And so when God tells us to do something, we probably ought to do it. Okay? And so Lord's Supper for commemoration. 
There's all kinds of different beliefs in that. Every time we talk about one of these things, there are all kinds of fringe beliefs that go along with it. There's some people that have closed communion, which means it's just for the members of the church. And so if I were to have communion tonight, or pastor would come in here and say, we're going to have communion, we'd say, okay, if you're not a member of this church, you need to leave. Because we, we believe in a closed communion. And then there's open communion. Anyone and their mom could come in here uh, from the streets and have communion with us. Now, realize something. That's dangerous. Because I'm not, I'm not saying I'm for one way or the other. Um, but that's dangerous. Because if someone drinks of the cup unworthily, go read about that. And, uh, you know, that's a big deal. And so we've got to look at those things. And, and, and do we need to take a stand on some things? You know, Curtis Hudson said something one time. He's, he was talking about all these divisions and all these problems with theology and all these differences in beliefs. He said, you know, at some point you've got to figure out what hills you're willing to die on. What hills are we willing to die on? Are we going to die on the hill of the Lord's Supper and which one is right and which one's wrong? You may want to, and you go right ahead. Uh, but some things just we do not need to fight over, Okay. Uh, number, uh, number five, in, I, independence and autonomy of the local New Testament church. So another major distinction of the Baptist is the very unpopular view of independence or autonomy. Most Christian sects quickly scrambled to establish hierarchies and people who are in positions of higher authority to make decisions on behalf of the church. There's much, of course, we can get into here, but for time's sake, we probably won't. Um, so Christ is the head of the church. We know that in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 17 through 18. Would anyone disagree that Christ is the head of church? No. We all know that Christ is the head of church. But in the Bible, the Bible tells us that there are those who are over us in the Lord. It's found in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. So now, as a Bible reader, you've got to step back and say, Well, who's over me in the Lord? That doesn't mean a mediator. That means someone who is there to guide you and help you spiritually. Now, who would that be? Probably the pastor. Uh, probably talking about a pastor. Probably talking about maybe some deacons. Probably talking about maybe uh, we could go as far as saying maybe some Sunday school teachers, people who are, in, who are in positions of authority, those who are over you to help you and guide you spiritually. And it says, know them which labor among you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Okay. And so, uh, the proclamation of Christ is the rock upon which the church is built. The local church has the authority to, dis this is what people don't like, has the authority to discipline. We don't ever talk about that much. But go read your Bible. Look at how Paul addressed some of these churches. Go, go read the books of First and Second Corinthians. I mean, Paul let it rip on them because they had some sin in the church and it wasn't being addressed. And he said, he literally said to give them over to the devil and, and basically kick them out because of what they're doing and what the problems they're causing. Okay? So discipline, choose deacons, and send missionaries. Baptists have never had a common creed, and it's equally true that they have never recognized any authoritative creed. They desire no such standard. Their attitude towards free speech and liberty of conscience has permitted and encouraged the largest latitude of opinions, yet none of us would care to increase these differences or make more acute variations. Someone said that. Uh, I didn't write down who it was. Um, FHIBC, look, here's what it comes down to. FHIBC does not need to line up with everything down uh, at Middle Tennessee Baptist Church. We don't. Now, are we part of a similar movement? Very much so. But we are an independent church. So if someone were to come in here and say, well, down at Middle Tennessee Baptist Church, we do it this way. Well, this ain't Middle Tennessee Baptist Church. And it's not Franklin Road Baptist Church. And it's not this Baptist Church and that Baptist Church, right? We have been given the Word of God. And we as God's people should be able to go back to this and say, this is what the Bible says. This is what we believe. And this is how we practice our faith here. Okay? I'm not going to get into the other ones. But I'm going to talk to you real quick about <clears throat> John Bunyan. If you get a chance, go online and read the trial of John Bunyan. Read the, the manuscript there of his trial with Judge Wingate. It's very interesting. Uh, he was, he was uh, brought to jail because he broke the law, which was that they could not preach outside of the established church. They couldn't preach at all in the name of Jesus Christ uh, outside of the established church. 
and of course John Bunyan's out there on the street preaching. And uh, he, was, he was brought to jail, and he said, I cannot, here's what he said to the judge, and he was very respectful the whole time. He said, I cannot do what you ask of me, my Lord. Of course, in those days, saying my Lord, Lord, was just a, a sign of respect. It would be like saying, sir, ma'am, okay? He said, I cannot do what you ask of me, my Lord. I cannot place my signature uh, there on any document in which I promise henceforth not to preach. My calling to preach the gospel is from God, and he alone can make me discontinue. He was bold, and guess what? He was sent to prison for six years. And while he was in prison, he wrote that wonderful book, The Pilgrim's Progress. He didn't have a pen. He didn't have paper. He used charcoal from the fire that kept him warm at night. And he wrote it down. He wrote The Pilgrim's Progress because of his bold stand on preaching without anyone telling him what he can or cannot do. Okay? So that's just a little bit about our Baptist history, some distinctives. I didn't get to go into all of them. The three S's is saved church membership, sanctified lifestyle. We believe in, in, in living a separated life and not being like the world, not bringing, uh, what's that girl's name, Taylor Swift into the church. Okay? We don't need to be singing. I don't care if she mentions the word God every now and then in a song. We're not singing Taylor Swift on this, pulp, uh, on this stage up here. Amen. I mean, you got to be careful. There's a lot of worldly country songs out there. Oh, that he mentioned God, or he mentioned Jesus. Or, yeah, but his other song is about getting drunk in the bar. Okay? And so we got to be careful with what we allow to get into the church, and we, we believe in separation, separation from the world. The Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, <clears throat> we believe in soul liberty of the individual. Two officers. I didn't even get to get into this. This is a good one. Pa pastors and deacons. Um, we talk about the prophets, evangelists, and pastors. Of course, prophets, Old Testament, um, apostles. Do we have apostles today? No. If you go read your Bible, the apostles have ceased. An apostle had to be someone who witnessed Christ firsthand and witnessed from, from the moment that John the Baptist was there uh, all the way up into his resurrection. Okay? A deacon, sir, uh, and we'll get, we could get into that. Separation, S, separation of church and state. Uh, personal separation, ecclesiastical separation. So that's all I've got for you tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we'll close out our meeting. So anyone got any comments, anything they'd like to say? All right, yes, ma'am. Amen. I wish I would have said that. That's, that's right, right down the line of exactly what it is. She said it's an outward sign of an inward change of heart, and that's, that's good. All right, let's go ahead and pray tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for this study tonight. And, uh, Father, once again, Lord, if I've said anything wrong, I know that I'll answer for it. And, and uh, Father, I, I don't, the last thing I ever want to do is, is say anything that's not true. And so, Father, I pray that you'd correct any, any falsehood that I have in my life, in my teaching. And, Lord, same with these people here standing or sitting before me. Uh, Father, if there's anything in their life that's wrong and not in line with, with your teaching found in the Word of God, sound doctrine, Lord, I pray that you correct those things. Bring us all together in one mind, in one accord, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And, uh, Lord, we uh, look forward to our pastor being back, and we pray you uh, just give him traveling mercies and help us now in this meeting to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, you could be dismissed tonight. Don't forget, we're going to have that meeting, so if everyone could come right up here for the meeting. <clears throat>